My name is Peter Lindemann and um, this is a production of a and Electronic Media and uh, today uh, we have a um, special guest, Jim Murray. Uh, he's not often in Spokane, in fact he uh, lives in Oklahoma, so we wanted to take advantage of this rare opportunity when we get together um, to give you this live interview as a um, um, an added value uh, for the talk that he gave at our conference uh, at the end of June. So, um, Jim, welcome. Thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah. And um, I look forward to uh, making this delivery, quite honestly. Great, great. I know that there's a lot of people interested in your work. And um, so uh, what I want to do is um, I'll ask I'll ask Jim maybe uh, five or six questions and uh, get the conversation started and uh, then we'll start taking some questions from uh, the live audience. So um, let's just start at the beginning. When did you get interested in science? When did all that start? Oh my God. Well, I was pretty young at the time. I think one of the things that really stimulated me, believe it or not, was my dad's train sets. Um, he was a very busy guy. and. Uh, it was sort of left up to me to get the stuff working, and in the process I took apart a lot of engines and tink tinkered around with motors and whatnot, and it never stopped from there. Uh, I also was interested in electromagnets at a very early age. It's one of my fondest memories, my first electromagnet. Mm -hmm. So how old were you then, just out of curiosity? Oh, Six, it, it's kind of hard to, to, to gauge, you know, the exact time when it started, mm -hmm. but I would definitely, uh, my grandfather was still alive, mm -hmm. and he died when I was five, so it okay. was actually before that. Great, okay. So, hey guys, you got, a, you got a guy who's been in science for, you know, 60 years. This is great. Um, so, um, moving forward a, a, quite a bit here, you actually built a linear accelerator as a school project. What were you in? Uh, was was that in high school or was that in uh, college? When was that? No, it was actually in high school. High school. You built a linear accelerator in high school. No. Yeah, I was totally captivated by the idea of particle accelerators. Uh -huh. And that happened um, when I was going to a boarding school out on Long Island uh, in my seventh and eighth grades. And I found a book on the subject. And it was very exciting for me because that book was one of the first things I ever read that linked particle accelerators to a Van de Graaff machine. Uh -huh. And prior to that, I had thought Van de Graaffs were just cool things for making big making sparks. Making big sparks, exactly. So I was hooked. And um, so, was it, did you actually have a Van de Graaff generator as the as the uh, energy source for the linear accelerator? Not then, no. Okay. I, I actually did that much later with a very big Van de Graaff machine in my basement, much to my consternate, my parents' consternation. Yes. But, um, no, in the school I basically used a cockroft waltham voltage multiplier. Which is just what, a diode yeah, capacitor a, bridge yeah, kind of thing? Exactly. Yeah, okay. For those of you who don't know. Um, so, um, where were you in, in high school when you built this? Uh, I was in a place called uh, Mount St. Charles Academy, which okay. is up in New England, uh, in the town of Woonsocket, Rhode Island. All right. I, and and what grade were you in? That would have been my sophomore and junior years. So I did I, I did two of them consecutively. Now, was this was this for a school project, a science fair? What was this? Well, initially it was for the school science fair, uh -huh. but um, I did so well with it that I wound up winning first prize in school, city, state, and then. I actually had a viewing for a two-week period at the Boston Museum of Science. Wow, amazing. And okay. uh, so I won quite a few awards. My dad was pretty happy. Yeah, so basically those were ribbons in a box now, right? Or, uh, no, I actually got a, a financial grant, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a lot of money in those days. Right. Like a couple hundred bucks. Uh -huh. but, but yeah, that, what, that, what, that was, uh, you know, a monetary recognition of your, of your uh, interest in science, for sure, and your ability to uh, follow through. And, Absolutely. Produce something uh, workable. Um, so from from that, it seems like you were you know moving you know along mainstream science. Um, you know the your lecture, um, Tesla's hidden discoveries at the at the conference kind of traces this you know this you know 
enigmatic blue notebook that uh, Tesla supposedly, uh, you know, put some of his uh, most astonishing ideas in. And so, how did you first hear about that? Where did how did you get off on that uh, pathway? Well, it's a little bit of a convoluted story, but I'll keep it short. Um, basically, what happened was I was very much interested in going to MIT. Mm -hmm. That was kind of like my dream, and I wanted to study uh, advanced particle physics and you know everything that goes with it. <clears throat> and um, unfortunately, my dad passed away from a max, uh, you know, a very big heart attack in in my senior year, and so those dreams were kind of dashed and. Um, what I wound up doing was um, putting myself through college, and to do that I went to work in the shipyards in um, Jersey City and New York and Staten Island and different places like that. And so I wound up hanging around the New York metropolitan area for several years that, that I didn't think I would do. Mm -hmm. And in that time period I met a very lovely gal, and uh, we started going together. And she uh, was pretty much aware of some of my more obtuse interests. So uh, on our first year anniversary, she presented me with a gift, which was a, a book about flying saucers. And uh, it's not that I didn't know about UFOs. I just didn't really care what the aliens were doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but the book really opened my eyes to a number of things. And um, it was actually called um, They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers uh -huh. by Gray Barker. Okay. And uh, the most astonishing thing that I found in that book was a, uh, an interview with a gentleman by the name of Dominic Lucchesi. Okay. And Lucchesi, as it turned out, lived right in Jersey City, which blew my mind. <laughs> and so I made it my personal uh, top priority to contact the guy. And um, it turned out we became really good friends. He and I had a lot in common, not only in science uh, of this sort, but in many different areas, and it was through him that I first learned about uh, Otis Carr, and I was quite astonished that somebody could be trying to do the things that Otis was attempting without everybody knowing about it. Right. And to me, that was a mind blower, you know. So I basically said to him, uh, well, gee, you know, what happened to this guy? And more or less said, well, nobody knows. Uh, and I said, well, I'm going to find him. And uh, I said, uh, do you have anything that can give me a lead? And he said, well, it was a guy who was supposedly his electronics technician who was supposedly floating around somewhere. And he said, I don't general. know where he is, <laughs> but I'll give you the name of someone who might know. Okay. And so he put me in touch with Jim Mosley, who was publishing this periodical at the time from Fort Lee, New Jersey, called... Uh, the Saucerian News. Okay. And um, interestingly enough, um, Mosley didn't recognize any connection uh, with anybody that he knew to uh, Otis Carr, but by coincidence, if there are such things, he said to me, uh, well, I do know about a guy up in Connecticut who was trying to raise money for an electric car that was supposed to operate on some extraordinary principle. And uh, he said, I can put you in touch with him. And it turned out that was the right guy. <laughs> Love those coincidences, yeah. So, um, and that was... Gene, that was Gene Carini. Gene Carini, exactly, okay. So, um, um, the, so the, so and Carini um, knew about the, the Blue Notebook, is that it? He knew about it, but he didn't know about it as, as necessarily something that had descended from Tesla. Uh -huh. um, when he and I got together, and we worked together for several years after that, uh, he basically told me about the fact that um, Carr never let anybody see it. Uh, he referenced it any time that he got in some kind of a bind. And um, what um, Carini uh, noticed the most was, they had built this eight, eight or ten foot um, uh, spacecraft, we'll call it that, uh, in Oklahoma City back in the 1950-something. And um, every time the electricians or himself got into any kind of a st sticky situation with the design, because he never produced any blueprints either, he used the old thing uh, that Tesla suggested, well, you, you better do it in your head if you want it to be right. And um, 
whether that was an excuse or whether that was truly a, a mode of operation worth adapting is never made clear, but that's what he did. And so Carini went in to see him in the office quite frequently and he was always referencing this notebook. So that's the first time I heard about it, but I, I didn't link it up with uh, the stuff uh, from Tesla until many years later when I actually was working with Carini on a full-time basis. Okay, and so, so, so you went up to work with Carini or meet Carini and he offered you a job to work on this electric car project? Yes, and I was 19 at the time. Wow. And so uh, even though I was in college, uh, the temptation was just too much. So uh, I was having trouble paying the bills anyway and I was going to school nights so at the, uh, at the semester break, I just said, hey, look, i got to go raise some serious money here. So I took uh, a leave or whatever they call it and, uh, and went up to uh, Connecticut to live. Okay. So, um, so Carini's um, arrangement was he was trying to get more torque out of the, uh, out of the electric motors in, in, in various um, situations. What, 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 was, what was different about his electric car project than anybody else's that you've seen? Well, first of all, I didn't even know of any other ones at that time, okay. which was kind of one of the reasons I jumped on it. But the, uh, the biggest difference was that Carini was wrestling with this idea that for some reason, if you had a motor that was moving and it was located on the periphery of a drive system as opposed to being stationary, uh -huh. that it had totally different characteristics okay. and that it would produce much more output power uh, for the same input. Okay. And um, I was pretty well steeped in physics. I had taken two years of physics in high school, uh, college physics in high school, and I had uh, taken advanced math and theory of equations and all that stuff. So to me, it was pretty challenging to say, well, why should that be so? Right. And so I was pretty well hooked at that point and started uh, building models um, for Carini, uh, mostly to understand what was different, right. if anything. Right. But also because his big uh, push at that time was uh, the production of a prototype that would be... Um, you know, eventually become a practical electric car. So I was trying to do both things at one time. Good. So you, you had plenty of spare time, right? You were, yeah, you weren't busy. No, not at all. Okay. So basically, <laughs> um, when, when you got into this project, you ended up running experiments that convinced you that there were two different torques being produced in an electric motor. Um, what's the significance of that? I mean, which is seemingly what Carini was trying to capture. Yeah, but it didn't happen overtly. Uh -huh. um, basically, what I did find out quite quickly in the game was that if you produce a geometry as uh, like he was advocating with the motors on the outside and you use a chain or a belt or something of that sort to, uh, to uh, engender the motion, um, that it just wasn't producing the results that he, that he, was, was, trying, yeah, that yeah. he was trying to achieve. And so when I started looking into that, what I realized was that, hey, there's something not quite right with this idea, at least not in this arrangement. Mm -hmm. And um, it led me down a long path of um, vector diagrams and, you know, all kinds of additional uh, contraptions for the sake of exploring what the impedance was all about. And what I discovered in the process was something that I should have really recognized right away, and that is Newton's third law says you know, you're going to have an equal and opposite action for every action. Right. And if you if you have a motor that's sitting out on the end of a of a cantilever, and you're using it to uh, drive itself, uh, you you'll achieve that. But the uh, the downside of it is going to be that the motor is going to have uh, an equal and opposite torque, which winds up being Can't. impressed on the same apparatus. So the, the, it just cancels it out. Well, it it doesn't completely cancel it out, otherwise nothing would have worked, right. but it, it's a very big negative. Mm -hmm. And so when I reported this, it was pretty close to the, um, the point in time where the uh, stockholders had already lost a great deal of faith in the whole thing, and so Karimi decided uh, not to uh, convey that information, but it didn't save the company, which eventually went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but what it did do was it set me up for further investigations on my own 
which I later did with Carini funding me personally from Florida where he retired and I was still in New Jersey and so I built machines that basically explored that concept and from those results I figured out how it eliminated. Uh -huh. So you figured out how to actually get both torques out of the motor without them being working against each other? Is that what you're saying? No, not exactly. Uh, what, what I figured out how to do was to separate them okay. in such a way that the negative aspect wouldn't interfere with the positive aspect. But that was only, it turned out that was only one of the many hurdles that had to be uh, overcome in order to see some kind of interesting results. Okay. So, so for instance, the, in Newton's third law, you know, basically says for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. And my interpretation of that has always been that what, what that really means is that um, uh, when forces are created in this 3D world, that they have to um, uh, apply themselves between two references. One is usually the, the, the base reference, and the other is then the thing that you want to move. But basically, the equal and opposite really is just the fact that the force is going gonna, is gonna to work on both of them, and one of them is usually more immovable than the other one, and therefore you see the force mostly on the, on the small uh, mass object rather than on the stage. So, so when you mount an electric motor and you bolt it to the, to the bench, then that's the one reference that isn't going to move so much, and so all the torque looks like it comes out on the shaft, and that's what we're taught. But what you're saying is, is that even with the thing bolted to the bench, you can, you can demonstrate that there's two separate torques? Well, sure. I mean, the easiest way to do that is to, um, is to put a load on the motor and undo the bolts. <laughs> then, the thing, then the thing wants to roll away. Yeah, right? you'll find out a big hurry. But uh, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, that's not a very practical approach, you see. Well, but the point is, the argument would be, is that there's still only one one force here and that it will always move the, 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 the object of least resistance. Absolutely. So the question is, what's the difference? Why, why did your experiment say there's actually two torques here rather than, or two forces in the system rather than just one? I can answer that question most easily by explaining the machine that I built that actually proved that point. Okay. So I made a machine that was very similar to Carini's. Um, the difference was that um, I used gears instead of belts because I didn't want to get all entangled with that additional variable. Right. And then the, the other thing that I did, was, which was different, was I had a lever arm, a secondary lever arm, which um, essentially tied the stator of the motor to a reference frame in the, in the shape of a circular path. Okay. And on that canter lever, I had a bearing, and that whole thing's length was adjustable. Okay. So by making adjustments on that, I could literally change the angular relationship between the stator of the motor and the armature of the motor, which was driving the gearing, which rotated the entire assembly. And, uh, and you, show, you, show, you show pictures of this machine in, in this presentation, right? Yes, I do. Okay. And so what I learned from that, which was pretty astounding, was that if you use a DC permanent magnet motor and you set the polarity of the input from the power supply, which is not going to be changed, and let's say we use that to establish a clockwise rotation, that I could adjust the angle of the stator by changing the length of this moment arm on the, uh, that was rotating around on the, uh, the reference plane. And all of a sudden you'd get to a point where you had no motion, and then if you went beyond that point, it would reverse direction. Even though you didn't. Reverse. Even though I didn't reverse the current. Got it. And so that's what convinced you that there were these two separate torques. There are well, there were always two separate okay. torques, but the point is, in Carini's device, both of them were set free. Got it. And the problem was that one was more powerful than the other, but the other one was having a negative effect on the results he was hoping to achieve. Got it. Got it. So that's why the electric car process that he was working on didn't really it didn't produce anything. Produce the right results. Got yeah. it. Got it. So um, these this set of experiments then led to other discoveries about the relativistic nature of power itself. Yes, and believe it or not, that's where Tesla comes into the picture because I was simultaneously interested all through this time period in Tesla's work. 
And as a matter of fact, Carini was one of the people that solidified that by giving me this fantastic book, which was printed in Yugoslavia, called Lectures, Patents, and Articles. And um, that book stimulated me completely in the Tesla direction. But um, the thing that had the most effect with regard to um, Carini's device was Tesla's article on the rotation of the moon. And I, I just couldn't get it through my head. It was, what the heck did he care about the moon when he was building, you know, wireless power transmitters? You know, it seems incongruous. Yeah, it did. Right. But because I was determined to understand everything about Tesla's mindset, I investigated this to the best of my ability. And when I started to understand the mechanics involved in, in the reason why the moon always shows one face with respect to us on Earth, mm -hmm. Um, that introduced me to epicyclic mechanics. Okay. And once you start studying epicyclics and you realize that there are some really bizarre things that happen with very innocent looking arrangements, and I further realized that whether he knew it or not, Carini was employing an epicyclic arrangement with his contraption for the electric car. Mm -hmm. And so I started all over from scratch. I built a very, very simple device it consisted of one motor, one moment arm, and two gears, uh, and I investigated it thoroughly with the idea of following the uh, dictates of epicyclic engineering. And when I did that, then all of a sudden I realized, after a lot of measurements and a lot of calculations, that what Carini had been trying to say all along, and how he knew it, I'm not sure, was that Horsepower itself is not of the same value when it's in a reference frame different from your own. Mm -hmm. And it can, it can either be greater than or less than what you measure on the ultimate output, but it, the point is that it's different. Mm -hmm. And so I went out of my way then to understand the mathematics involved in that and built numerous machines to try and capitalize on that type of arrangement. Well, first you didn't try and capitalize on you. First you just tried to prove that that was absolutely for sure right. Well, yes, but what I meant by capitalize right. was to produce worthwhile results, not right. necessarily make a lot of money. Right, yeah, I understand, yeah. So, so, um, uh, and you show the machine, you show those machines in, in your lecture as well. Yes, I did. Yeah. As ma well, not all of them, because some of them don't exist anymore. Right. But I did show as many as I had um, photographs of. Right. And so you can see these these arrangements uh, in in the film uh, Tesla's hidden discoveries. So um, the where this all leads is um, a a situation where um, by creating a secondary um, reference in the output section, um, you can divide the resistance of the of the output. Uh, between the input and, and this other reference, and this is what led to the gravitational torque amplifier? Yes, but long before that happened, what, what it forced me to realize, because I kept referencing Tesla all the time, right. looking for extra information, and what I finally realized was that, you know, tes Tesla with, may not have been given credit for this, but he was actually one heck of a mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was interesting was, um, I reread that Earth Moon article a thousand times, and it's one of the only articles that he gets into some pretty interesting calculations involving moment of inertia. And so my next port of call was to understand um, the real meaning of moment of inertia, because a motor that's located on the uh, on the outer end of a, a pivotal arm has an extraordinary moment of inertia. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's interesting is we generally look at that from the standpoint of the effect of turning a central shaft. And when you do, you know, you, you feel this enormous resistance to acceleration, which of course we define by the moment of inertia concept. But the interesting thing is, uh, which then became obvious, was that if you, if you are applying the driving force from the rim where the motor is located, it kind of turns the entire thing inside out. And you get a much bigger mechanical advantage. You get a mechanical advantage. And so I started to see that regardless of where Carini had gotten this information from, 
that it wasn't completely bogus. Mm -hmm. And then I started to realize that um, the Tesla, because um, it's actually apparent when you start thinking about it this way and you read his stuff, that he used many, many different types of mechanical analogies to lead him to a much deeper understanding of electrical phenomena, mm -hmm. which then allowed me to realize, hey, if I can solve this problem, then there's going to be a, um, a situation that's analogous to it in the electrical arena. Mm -hmm. And then we'll start to understand things like the magnifying transmitter and all of these other things that he talked about, which people are so, you know, eager to dismiss. Right. So, so basically, uh, my understanding is, is that Tesla's understanding of electricity was that it was always the movement of mass, whether it was uh, somebody called it electrons or, or, or his uh, um, radiant energy particles or, or these types of things. He was always talking about um, the, the movement of a, particular, of a particle and that those particles had mass and therefore electricity is really not a form of energy but a, a movement of mass that shows relationship to gravity, inertia, all of these properties. Electricity has interactions directly with, with inertia and gravity. Was that what you came to? I didn't come to that directly, <coughs> although I, um, do you, do you I currently, came across it. Do you currently believe that's true? Oh, or? I definitely believe that's okay. true. And I'll, and I'll go so far as to say this. In my investigations, um, in trying to locate Otis Carr, which I eventually succeeded in doing, by the way, um, I came across all kinds of stuff that led me to him. And one of them was a letter that was written in support of Carr's work by a priest who was also a physicist. And that is one of the most profound documents I've ever read because it suggests and explains, uh, at least pretty thoroughly, why there is always an electrical disturbance associated with a change in gravitational potential. And so that then, the converse of that is that a proper change in electrical conditions should produce a gravitational, a gravitational effect. effect right. And then once I got into all of that, I'm starting to put things together a lot more rapidly. The thing that really was the greatest impedance was um, was the fact that, uh, you know, everybody believes this stuff not to be possible, and so it's so hard to find worthwhile information. Yeah. I had to engineer all my own tests and figure out ways of funding them and do all of that while I was going to school or raising a family or all the other stuff. Right. So it's been a long-term long, situation. Long it looks like we've got a bunch of uh, possible questions coming in from uh, the audience, people who are interested in what we're talking about here. Ivan, uh, yeah, uh, we're going to unmute Ivan here. Oh, I know Ivan. So, Ivan, you're unmuted. Can you, uh, can you unmute? Oh, hi you? there. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I didn't realize. I stepped out for a second. I just Great. Back. You got a question? No, I didn't have a question. Uh, actually, I've had the privilege of uh, listening to uh, Jim uh, a number of times, and one of the things, all right, I will have a question. Uh, on the uh, electrical and connection with the electrical discharge and gravity. you want to elaborate on that? Well, I'd be happy to elaborate on it, except I don't know that much about it. I can only tell you what I read in this, in this guy's report. And, of course, you know, it does mirror things that other professionals have said. <clears throat> I think it was, um, what was the name of that early investigator that claimed that he uh, found a link between gravity and... Uh, Oh, T. Townsend Brown. You no, know, before him. Oh, before. Uh, anyway, it was, uh, there were a number of people that made the similar statements. And so, um, in my opinion, it, there is something there. Intuitively, it feels right. Um, I think that um, stuff that Otis Carr uh, shared with me many years later sort of cinches it because he said that the planet Earth uh, generates a gravitational field. And that if you understand the, um, the uh, components of the Earth as a machine, you will eventually understand what a gravitational field is. And that's a very profound statement because um, what Newton's work does is it simply gives us a mathematical um, expression that allows us to uh, compute 
what a gravitational force should be between two specific masses, but it doesn't say anything about the cause of that force. And uh, the only other person I'm aware of who made inroads in this direction was Wilhelm Reich, because he claimed that um, gravity was actually uh, caused by these uh, fields of uh, orgone energy being absorbed into the Earth. So um, I, I truly believe there's a relationship there. I just can't, uh, I can't tell you exactly what it is, and I'm not privileged to any more advanced information. But to be honest with you, I got my hands full as it is. <laughs> okay, well let's, um, let's look at maybe some of the things from the chat, uh, the, the, the written questions. Somebody's asking, uh, do you have a copy of, uh, uh, of uh, Tom Bearden's uh, Gravito Biology? I, I don't have a copy of it, but I am aware of it. And of course, Tom Bearden and I used to collaborate many years ago. Okay. Jim, are you familiar with Dan Winters' perspectives with gravity? I've heard the name Dan Winters, but that's about as far as it goes. I honestly don't know anything about what he has in mind. Okay. Uh, yeah, Dan Winters' work is uh, monumental, and uh, he was pretty much drummed out of the United States for, uh, he's in France currently. Um, uh, <laughs> he says, Jim, you want to discuss your own ET experience? I don't think you've had one, have you? I don't know. Uh, I say I don't know because I definitely had some pretty strange experiences through the years, but I don't know that they're worth discussing right now because they're very tangential to the uh, thrust of this interview. Uh -huh. I'll leave that up to you. Okay, De uh, Dennis Marvel, uh, you've got your hand up. We just gave you an open mic. Can you, uh, are, are, is your microphone on? Yes, it is. Great. Uh, you're, uh, uh, yeah, just speak up so that others can hear you and um, ask, your, ask your question. Jim, in your studies of Tesla's work, uh, I wonder if you ever came across uh, an answer to a question that I had when I read Jerry Vassilato's account uh, of uh, his development. Uh, when he was uh, employing his magnetically quenched uh, arc disruptor to generate uh, the abrupt shock pulses uh, into his loopback circuit, he was... Uh, able to adjust that timing very precisely down to 100 microseconds or even one microsecond. And I was wondering how he was able to measure such uh, small uh, time intervals with the equipment that he had. Well, you put me in a very peculiar position by asking me this question. Um, I know Mr. Vassilanos and I used to associate with him many years ago, and I'm not going to say anything negative about him, but I will tell you this. He interviewed me and many, many other people um, concerning the book that he wanted to write. And I did my best to answer the questions for him. And after he had um, thoroughly milked my brain, um, he went on to uh, write the book and do whatever he did without supplying me any feedback. So unfortunately, whatever it is that he did or is claiming, I really have no knowledge of it at all. So, so basically, um, the, the bottom line answer um, is that um, Tesla, Tesla used the exact argument that it's very difficult to know exactly what frequencies that they were dealing with. This, is, this was part of his um, explanation of why he never believed that uh, Heinrich Hertz uh, discovered the propagation of transverse waves, because he believed that Hertz's arrangement um, wasn't measuring the actual frequencies being generated by the equipment and it wasn't doing it properly. And uh, so he, he must have had a way because he was very adamant about the fact that Hertz had not found a way to um, transmit uh, transverse waves in the air. Well, I can comment on that aspect. Yeah, yeah. Um, the interesting thing there is that, as you know, if you do a disruptive discharge or encourage a disruptive discharge for the purpose of generating, you know, a, a transmission of any kind, that you do not wind up with a pure, you sine know, pure wave. sine wave. Right, right. Um, if you're lucky, I mean really lucky, you wind up with a, 
a, dec a logarithmic decrement uh, which contains a sine wave, but the fact that it would ever be a, a pure fundamental wave is probably non-existent. Yeah. And so you're going to have a whole bunch of harmonics involved. And Tesla knew this. But the interesting thing is this. If you have a repetitive function that even if it consists of a series of harmonics that are all superimposed, you can have constant periodicity. Right. And this is one of the reasons why Tesla was so keen on measuring period rather than frequency. frequency. Exactly. And that's where he concentrated a lot of his stuff. And incidentally, that ties in in the long run to what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. I mean, he was the first one to uh, show the the mechanical commutators that had the V sections where he could move the the, the, the brush uh, in and out to change the pulse width. And so, I mean, he invented pulse width modulation. He invented all of these things to create these these uh, periodicities in, in DC systems. Because he wasn't really interested. Once, once he realized that the AC system, you know, really, because all the energy you put in to make everything go this way, you, you kind of had to slow it down. Once he understood that, that electricity had these inertial properties, the last thing you want to do is just throw away all the inertia and then recreate it and throw it away and recreate it and throw it away. That's what oscillating currents would do. And so he wanted to create things that had a progression in the same direction so that at least the, the, uh, the inertial properties could be conserved with the particle movements and the pressures generated and things like this. And, and, uh, and interestingly enough, on that same note, now that you brought it up, the thing that's interesting is that when, um, um, when the original investigators were trying to, to uh, make a determination of just how um, energy was transmitted by means of electrical waves, they had a choice to make. and. Um, they didn't know for sure if it was carried by momentum, like a particle would do, or if it was totally stored in the, in the mechanics of the fields that are involved. And so a lot of people were investigating that very thing. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Maxwell um, was relying on the output from that very question right. to determine which way he was going to go. And early investigations were done with relatively crude equipment that could not demonstrate inertial characteristics. Right. So he made the assumption that there weren't any. Right. And interestingly well, enough, this is came out of Helmholtz's work, um, where where you know the the idea was that there was two possibilities: one a transverse um, transmission, and the other was a longitudinal transmission. And Helmholtz came to the conclusion, like you said, because they couldn't demonstrate any inertial properties that the, that, that the longitudinal transmissions didn't exist and therefore the um, transverse uh, was the way to go. Transverse was the way to go and, and so uh, um, the, the equations of Maxwell were all based on, on the assumption that there was no longitudinal to have and so all those, tra all those equations are about transverse. Yes, but interestingly enough, no sooner did he release those equations than Einstein and de Haas duplicated the earlier investigators' work and they found that there's all kinds of inertial characteristics. But, you know, in the true spirit of real science, they decided not to rock the boat by making any changes and so they let it go through the way it was. But I believe that Tesla was keenly aware of the inertial characteristics because if you read his early notes, even the notes um, from the uh, Colorado Springs diary, he talks about calculations which clearly include the inertial aspects and the mass measurements, even of his conductors. Right. And so he was really tuned into that stuff. Right, exactly. So, what do we got? Okay. Um, what is the orgone energy? Is this the energy that Tesla used to make over unity devices? Um, well, that's that's been um, you know that's a well, first of all, orgone energy is a um, a name that was given to a what what uh, Wilhelm Reich referred to as a, a primordial mass-free energy in the in the general environment. And he named it after um, the human orgasm because he felt that that was the, um, the 
uh, most um, energetic expression of that energy. In other words, it was related directly to uh, biological uh, processes. Um, so whether or not, um, certainly Tesla uh, never was aware of that terminology uh, because they um, uh, were really in different fields. Um, so, well, he may very well have discovered aspects of it if, in fact, it is related right. uh, to other things as as Reich himself suggests. Right. So who knows? You know. Well, I, w I would say that there there there's a relationship. I I try and keep uh, terminologies in separate boxes, but um, I mean uh, Wilhelm Reich was very clear that uh, even just a set of rubber gloves left in the sunlight would charge up with this energy. And um, Tesla was very keen on, on talking about how sunlight had these uh, charging effects on, on metal sheets and all kinds of other things that, in fact, you can see uh, in his uh, radiant energy patents. Uh, just a, a sheet of copper in the sunlight would charge a capacitor to the point where uh, it w the capacitor would fail, the dielectric would fail. Um, and that was his um, demonstration that the, the sunlight basically had, even though it seemed like a, a, a feeble charge capability, um, the, the actual voltage potential gradient in sunlight was of a, a, an enormously high voltage because it could continue to charge a, a capacitor until the dielectric failed, and he never did find a dielectric that wouldn't fail under that circumstance. So it's. Uh, there's, there's certainly um, reasonable uh, overlaps in these types of discoveries. Uh, it's just very, very difficult to take, take experiments out of one context and, 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 and say how they relate to another in, in this regard. So what we're, what we're going to do today um, is we've, we've scheduled to release um, Tesla's Hidden Discoveries, which is uh, the uh, video format of uh, the talk that Jim gave at our conference in, uh, in June. Uh, and we had, um, we probably told everybody on all the lists that that was going to be released next Tuesday. And uh, what we want to do instead and, uh, is give uh, everybody uh, who's on the live interview right now with us um, the first heads up that we are releasing um, that uh, product right now, and uh, uh, is it is it is it live at this point? Okay, um, Aaron says it's live and it's at uh, teslashiddendiscoveries.com. I just chatted it. And uh, he's just put a hot link uh, right there in the chat, so uh, anybody who's interested uh, in learning more about what we've been talking about. Uh, can definitely go there and uh, pick up a copy of of that. Uh, it's about an hour and a half lecture, and uh, so here's another one. Um, uh, have you worked with uh, Eric Dollard's perspective on um, magnetic reflector and dielectric properties? I don't understand the, the question exactly. Perspectives on metal. Perspectives on metal. Well, the answer that I can best give is this. I met Eric Dollard a good 20 years ago, and we had an enormous amount of stuff in common. And originally, we um, interacted on a regular basis. He was very kind uh, enough to teach me a lot of interesting things. But our uh, general investigations were in slightly different directions. And then, unfortunately, um, uh, Eric became rather inaccessible, shall we say. And so I, um, I didn't continue that association. But um, I do know a great deal about his work, and of course I concur with most everything that he is teaching. The only difference is that uh, I'm playing around with very fundamental things simply because I feel that the understanding of those issues are incomplete, whereas Eric is working on a much higher octave of uh, expression that is more related to Tesla's uh, uh, communication systems and his wireless transmission of power. 
And even though I've dabbled in those areas, I haven't really had the opportunity to go there. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, question, how many of Tesla's patents are still sequestered by the U.S. government? Um, I'm not sure anybody um, knows the answer to that question. Um, anybody in the public domain, um, I don't know how I would know or find out. Um, uh, I have one comment on that. Um, a number of years ago, I was considering writing my own book on Tesla's investigations, which would have been directed specifically by my personal interpretations and my own investigations. And during that period of time when I was gathering information for the book, I made contact with Margaret Cheney, who I thought was a fantastic um, author, and her book, of course, Man Out of Time, was very much dedicated towards Tesla, and I liked her perspective, by the way. I think it was very unique. Uh, but during my exchanges with Margaret, what came to light, which was interesting, was that they had petitioned under the Freedom of Information mm -hmm. Act to try and get um, a lot of questions answered uh, through the normal channels of government. And um, when anything was a little bit too obtuse, uh, they were denied access to it or else they were just told it didn't exist. And um, she was um, observant enough to realize that that was pretty much a dodge um, because it was already known that they had information along those lines. Mm -hmm. So um, the other thing is that generally speaking, if the way patent law is written, if a patent is granted, then it's pretty hard to suppress because it's immediately published and somebody should have a copy of it. But that doesn't mean that everything that's in their possession was ever patented. And that's another thing that's worthy of consideration. When Tesla died, and I like to put that in quotes, um, his safe was rifled in his apartment and actually nobody knows what was in there, literally. And so, um, even though he was working on all kinds of interesting stuff in that period of his life, um, uh, and a, a, total, um, a total list of those things uh, has been denied to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, good question. Um, but, yeah, broaden it up. There's definitely things that Tesla was working on that... Um, I've never made it into the public domain, and that's about all we know about it. Um, so, um, yeah, if there's no more questions. Yeah, if there's if there's no more questions, um, uh, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, uh, this is a, a, a rare opportunity to uh, um, you know learn more. Um, there's. Uh, we could probably talk to Jim for five days and he would still have astonishing uh, revelations to give us. Um, but again, um, Tesla's Hidden Discoveries uh, is, a, is a spectacular uh, presentation. It's a lecture and PowerPoint that he gave at the conference. And um, there's uh, over, over 100 slides, I think. And it's uh, over an hour and a half. Uh, in, in downloadable video form. So um, definitely um, follow that link and uh, get yours today. Uh, and, and again, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a, a presentation of AMP Electronic Media. And um, thank you, Jim, for uh, all of your wisdom and sharing uh, everything with us today. That's not a problem, Peter. I enjoyed it. And in closing, I would just like to remark that Anybody that's interested in pursuing this stuff um, can always rely on me to be open with them and uh, as helpful as I can be under these circumstances. But if you um, purchase this material and you uh, decide to uh, pursue it, don't let anybody tell you there's nothing there. Believe me, it's loaded. Right. And also, um, uh, Jim has also uh, begun a long-term relationship with us as his publisher and we're going to start bringing out uh, a lot of other products um, uh, that include 
um, you know, specific experimental setups with some of the machines that we've talked about today, we just mentioned. Uh, we'll have complete presentations on uh, the operations and uh, of, of these unusual machines and, uh, and what they teach us about uh, the behavior of, of the natural world and electricity and power and relativistic effects. So um, stay tuned for those in the future as well. Uh, Aaron, do you have any last... Uh, yeah, I'll goal? be sending out updates on uh, Energy Times and the other newsletters. This video will be on YouTube and then, yeah, Tesla's HiddenDiscoveries.com. They can go there right now. It's right. live. They can get Jim's presentation and just want to thank everybody. And yeah, thank you everybody. And, and uh, if you do have, uh, if you do watch it and you, uh, and, and you like it, um, send us a, a testimonial on it. And if you don't like it, don't send us a testimony on it. That's, that's <laughs> simple enough. I mean, uh, so uh, <laughs> um, anyway, thanks again. Uh, it's been about an hour, and uh, that's a wrap. Thanks again for joining us. Goodbye to you all. Bye.